Welcome aboard the Boat Buyers Secret Weapon Podcast, where we're dedicated to helping first-time and experienced boat buyers find the right boat at the best price, so they have years and years of boating fun, because life truly is better on a boat. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Boat Buyers Secret Weapon YouTube channel. Don't pay too much for your next boat. Just visit BoatBuyersSecretWeapon.com slash save to watch a short video. Now, let's hop aboard and have some fun. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Boat Buyer Secret Weapon Podcast. I'm your host, Captain Matt. And today we're here with Darcy, who's up in Minnesota, um, currently has a, a 23-foot Sea Ray, looking to change the boating lifestyle a little bit. So, Darcy, thank you for, for joining us here. And tell us a little bit about what you're looking to do. Yeah. Thanks for uh, for having me, Matt. I, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time and, and, and talking about this kind of stuff with me. So, um, yeah, I'm looking to get into something a little bit bigger um, to get out on to uh, Lake Superior um, and, and to, you know, explore some of the areas out there. There's some islands, there's National Park out there, um, there's National Lake Shores, and uh, just looking to uh, not have to, um, well, worry so much about fuel with the smaller 23-foot boat. Um, getting into something that can handle the waves a little bit more and get me a little bit more distance and uh, and have a little bit more comfort during the overnights. So, um, so yeah, that's really uh, why I'm looking at the types of boats that I'm looking at now. Okay. So tell me a little bit about, you You said doing the overnights. You, you've got the Sea Ray right now. That's more of a, a day boat, a bow rider, I assume, um, depending on what model you have. Tell me what, what do you see kind of being uh, this coming summer what would be your perfect day out on the water? What does that look like? Yeah, so um, it would be like departing from somewhere along the north shore of Minnesota, um, heading over toward uh, toward like Isle Royal or like I said, maybe the Bay Bayfield area in Wisconsin, and uh, um, you know, along the way, maybe maybe putting some lines out and, and fishing a little bit along the way to, to catch lunch or dinner. I'm not really spending the entire day out fishing, but just kind of as a means to to have a little fun in, in route and then get to uh, get to the dock or the anchorage um, in order to just sort of enjoy the wilderness. Okay, yeah. While while you're out there, you might as well grab some uh, grab some delicious lunch. That makes sense. Um, what about what will your crew look like? Are you going out just yourself? Is this a family adventure? What what does that look like? Yeah. So. Um, could vary. I, I know that, I mean, there's a number of friends of mine that would want to go. My, my wife would probably <laughs> come out maybe once, once uh, a summer maybe, but uh, yeah, maybe it, it could vary from maybe one per one F other person to possibly four or five. Okay. So four to five would be the max. Um, obviously yeah. when you're, when you're talking about overnight, that's something that you really want to consider is, what's the sleeping configuration is going to look like and, and um, how often are you going to have just two of you? That's going to be comfortable. Pretty much anything that um, uh, that you mentioned you were interested in. Um, okay. So tell me a little bit about when you do overnight, are you going to be on, uh, on the anchor? Mm. So uh, that could, that could vary quite a bit. Um, you know, some of the, the dock spaces are a little bit more open than others. Okay. Um, and I guess I'd rather not be bouncing around all night on the waves um, if I don't have to be. So, you know, I would probably carry a tent or, you know, or possibly go to a shelter if it gets to be a little too rough. Okay. Um, so okay. I think there's some flexibility there. Okay. Very good. And, and I'm not, I, I've never been out on any of the great lakes. So, so tell me a little bit about Lake Superior and what that chop looks like, you know, give me relative to running your, your sea ray, or are there some days you just don't go out cause it's, it's too, uh, white caps are, are flowing or, um, uh, what's that, oh, what's sure. that water look like? Yeah, it's uh, yeah. There are it's not so much the white caps as the the overall size. I mean, I you know I kind of want to be watching the NOAA website and the weather to understand if you know if they're forecasting waves to get you know upwards of five to seven foot. Probably not something I want to be out there in in the twenty three foot boat. Um, but certainly you know um, it it 
it can change in an instant. So I'm real careful to watch the, the weather and stay away from, you know, anything getting up to seven, 10 foot waves. It's not really, okay. um, ideal. so yeah, you, you know, I guess, you know, plan for the best, but be prepared to duck into some shelter <laughs> if I need to. Okay. Very good. Yeah. That it's, it's an experience that is on my list to, to get up there. Um, but, uh, but I know you've got a, a lot more challenging boating environment than, than some of the inland freshwater lakes that are, are much smaller. Um, certainly more coastal like boating, you have to look at the weather and, and paying attention to the waves and, um, the, the size and the, the distance between. So, um, tell me a, a little bit about your budget and, and the, the years that you're thinking, it, it, cause I know you've started looking a little bit. I don't know if that's just mm -hmm. online or if you've actually personally inspected some, uh, some of these cruisers that you're considering. Yeah. So I primarily online, I did a little bit of looking around when I, when I purchased my, my current CRA, uh, a few years back, but you know, I, I'll just say the, the most agreed upon budget that we are talking is in the 30,000 range. So we're not okay. looking to get up into the, to the 60, 70, hundred, that, that, Maybe that's down the line, but um, but for right now, I'd like to keep it a little bit more in that thirty thousand range. Okay, so when you're when you're looking at at pre-owned cruisers, there's a there's a couple of things that I think are important. Um, is one is to um, to find the layout that's going to be most suitable for what you're looking at. Um, so have you, have you boarded any of these cruisers or been on friends cruisers and, and seen some things that you like and don't like? Uh, not so much. I mean, um, y you know, just, it's been a number of years, so nothing that really comes to mind. Um, the one thing that I would say is, you know, I, I, I like the dual helm idea, um, okay. because that would allow me to get um, you know, on days when it's, when it's raining or, you know, it's, there's too much mist as we're going, you know, through some chop, um, that would kind of give me a little bit of shelter and we're not, we're not out there in the elements. So I think I like that dual helm idea, but that's about the extent of that I've thought about too much about the layout. Okay. Okay. Well, I think there's, you know, when you take that step from a bow rider to a cruiser, you you take the step up of okay there's a lot more options for systems a lot more options for layouts you know the the having the the uh, dual helm is is one of them for sure um canvas options which you had a question about um do you want a generator or no generator air conditioning um you know probably you're a little further north so that may not be um, be something that is an absolute must. So let's talk about, go through some of those options and um, let's start with the generator. Um, when you are yeah. overnighting, you said, okay, maybe we're, don't really want to be on anchor, maybe at a marina, maybe just, um, you know, on a, on an island where you've got camping facilities. Um, it, do you yeah. see yourself, hey, I really need air conditioning and I'm really going to be running a bunch of systems while I'm out away from power, shore power or, um, or your home marina? Uh, yeah, I'd say no, I, that, that might be a nice to have and maybe a nice option for a, a little while into the evening. But, but I think the, the goal for me is just to kind of get away from some of those things. So I guess I'd, I'd see the generator as maybe a nice to have um, just occasionally, but I don't think I would want to to spend money to get one if that's okay okay because that definitely it, it puts you in a, a size category where you've got to have room you know 28 feet or more typically um to to get that generator as a a common feature um now let's talk about the uh, the air conditioning um most boats are going to have some little level of air conditioning you know as you get older and older it's a matter of how reliable is it um you know, that may be something that just like you said, you're really looking to get away uh, and escape. That may not be as important. I, am I, am I catching that right? Yeah, I think so. And especially on, on Lake Superior, it's uh, the heat would be more of a problem than the air conditioning. So, uh, <laughs> so I, would say, 
Um, not not a huge need for me. And actually thinking about that too, the the heat probably not such a big deal. We could, you know, I it, I'm not super worried about the the air conditioning. Okay, okay. So that that makes the systems part much easier. You've got, you know, you got the access to throw a grill on it and, and cook up your your fish that you catch. Um, some of the systems will run off the off the battery power, so you're good there. Um, let's talk about about layout. You, you mentioned bringing a tent along at times. Um, would you like to yeah. sleep on the boat, or do you prefer? Hey, I want to go out, find that island, and, and have my camping spot. And, and the boat's just my means of transportation and entertainment during the day. Or man, I would really like it to be all inclusive. Yeah, I, I'd like it to be all inclusive. I'd like to have a, a, a bit of comfort there with uh, with possibly a couple beds. Um, okay, you know, for people to 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 take advantage of if you know if, if things fill up on the campgrounds or that kind of thing. We I, I would want to have that option available. If you, if you Perfect. Are you? Tell me how how big a guy are you? Oh, around two hundred pounds. Okay. So, All right. I, like, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm six. The reason I ask is I, I'm six two, you know, two twenty, two thirty. Um, and you're you're in a twenty six foot cruiser, and you're like, man, I can't even hardly stretch out. The you know, you may uh, not fit in the V berth. That that's why I'm asking is the the uh, taller you are, the bigger you are. Um, you know, it's something that you want to think about if you're spending you know two three nights in a row that uh all right I, I want some room to stretch out a little bit um so so how tall are you i guess may have been a better a better way to ask that <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, yeah. hey are so you I, fat or are you not fat that sorry <laughs> sorry darcy i was not very uh <laughs> no worries <laughs> so yeah i'm uh you know i'm about five ten. okay all right so you're gonna anything over 26 28 feet you're gonna have pretty good standing room in most models um, this is one of the things that I encourage people to do that are looking at cruisers is um, go get in a couple. Uh, so, you know, if you if you can look around, even if you just walk a local marina and, you know, maybe bring a 12 pack with you and say, hey, I'm looking at buying a cruiser. Um, find a couple that you like that. It, like hey, that could that could fit. That seems to be in the price range from my research online stop by and say, Hey, I'm looking at a cruiser. I would love to board your boat. You know, can I give you a couple beers and, and let me on, um, or look at a couple that are for sale and, and just go get on them, slip your shoes off and, you know, sit in the V berth, uh, lay in the aft cabin if it has one. And, and I think that might be something that would make sense for you. Um, is, are, are you familiar with what, what a aft cabin is? You know, I've, them listed but i guess i wouldn't i don't know how to spot them versus so uh, you know i'll, I'll give you something. i'll give you kind of some terminology so in in the cruiser world the v berth is going to be the the bed in the front of the v hall so it's usually mm -hmm. going to be a dinette and a v berth so there's a table there at night you can set the table down put in a filler cushion and now you've got a bed um the dinette is one that will, you know, maybe it's a, like a picnic style bench with seats on both sides and a table. That table will drop down and form a bed, usually for shorter people, you know, kids. It's not going to be real long in most cases. Um, and then the aft cabin is just the cabin in the back of the boat. Um, like on the, the styles that you sent me, um, you might have to kind of duck down. It's going to be back under where the stairs are typically. Uh, it's going to be the full beam. And so for me, um, at my size, I like that aft cabin because it gives me, I, I can lay out fully and have plenty of room. Now it does take a little bit of, you know, maneuverability to get down there. Um, but it's a nice big open space once you get down there. Um, and so a, a boat that has that aft cabin set up. Now I'm not talking an aft cabin boat where, where they've actually built it so that there's almost like a stateroom back there. I'm just talking about a, a, a cabin in the, or a sleeping area in the back of the boat in the cabin that, um, th that might be a good layout for you. Um, yeah, but, okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, so Darcy, as you're looking, um, one of the best ways to figure out what that is is 
to actually go board a couple of boats. And now as you're looking at pictures and doing your research online, you'll have a really good sense when you see a picture, you can kind of feel what how that comfort level is going to be to you or you say, Ooh, that's no good for, for me. And you can just tell by looking at the picture. Um, but, but walking the docks and at a, at a Marine that has the types of boats that you're looking at, you know, you can usually board three or four of them in an afternoon and get a really good sense and, and maybe even ask some questions of people in your area that are, are, that own those boats. And they can give you some really good local insight as well of, oh, this option we love uh, because of on Lake Superior, this is what we find when we do what you're going to be doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, um, and, and typically, you know, typically a couple Bud Lights or, or Blue Moons will will make a friend at almost any any marina in the U.S. So, um, yeah. for sure. So that's good currency. Um, let's let's talk because I think this I think the dual helm thing could be nice. Um, but let again, I think you'll discover this when you go walk the docks a little bit. Let's talk about some canvas options. Okay. Um, no matter what boat you go with, um, you have, there's a, a just a, a, a ton of options for how you want the canvas to, to work. Um, and one of them that I really like is um, getting what's called a camper canvas. Um, and you can have this custom made by any local canvas person. So you, you just ask at a couple dealers or again at, at some local marinas for a good canvas person, and they will be able to custom build you whatever you want. Um, now, it may be yeah. $2,000, $2,500 to do it, um, but it's going to open up the, the type of boats that you have access to. Um, and when you use the Isinglass, are you familiar with that term? So when yeah, you put I, a, I am. <laughs> okay, good, Go good. Um, yeah, and I, I, this is also for people listening to when I, I want to define terms a little bit, but so Isinglass is just the clear plastic. It's, it's started out in some aviation and now they're, they're using it on, on boats and have been for decades, but it, it's a, just a plastic see-through glass and they sew that into the actual canvas. Um, and a lot of times it'll be zippered so you can zipper it, roll it up, get the breeze during the afternoon. But if weather does come up, you zip them down, you snap them in, and you actually have that enclosure. Um, but you don't have to limit yourself to boats that have that dual helm. Um, so I think yeah. that may be an option to consider that would open up some more boats for you. Um, so you can be more particular on the other features, uh, the other quality, and, and really inspect them well and, and find something that's going to fit your budget as well. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I think the, the thing that I questioned on that is, and maybe it's, maybe I had some, some bad experiences, but, you know, when, when I'm, you know, sort of underway and, and, you know, looking to pick up speed, sometimes that would not be the best. Um, you know, I just feel like the, the wind was kind of ripping through it and I was always concerned that it was going to be coming undone and all that kind of stuff so i that's one of the reasons why i was like well look, what if i just had a regular windshield and i just went down with that dual helm then i would could just you know then i could just tidy up the upper helm snap it up leave it alone and then now I've, i'm fully enclosed and i've got a glass windshield rather than dealing with the the flimsiness of those ising glass pieces yeah it, it definitely it definitely has its limitations and again without me knowing the specifics that you know i've never run a boat with ising glass on lake superior when a you know when a squall's kind of come up um and, and sort of caught you off guard um mm -hmm. that that would be one where i would say hey go talk to some of the folks on the dock um, and get their, get their insights. Um, and also if you were to go the canvas route, talk to the canvas person and say, Hey, listen, this is my concern. I want to make sure that if I put this up and in, in some weather's coming up, I want to make sure that it's not going to be blowing apart and causing damage to my boat and to, and have to repair the, the whole camper canvas. Um, I want to make sure it's it's going to be nice and sturdy. Can you do that or not on this style of boat? 
Um, yeah, and, 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 and keep it from, yeah. The other thing I would add to that is like keeping it from fogging up and then I'm just kind of trying to peel it out of the way and, and yeah. just so that I can kind of see, you, know I, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, I, I don't have the answer for that um, because it, it's not something that I, I have a lot of experience with. Um, but again, the, the local marina in this type of situation, Darcy, I think could be a real valuable resource for you um, to, to get some of those, those specific questions answered. Um, and and I, I, I got to tell you, I don't even know what, what brands have that dual helm option for you. Um, I, I know you mentioned the, uh, the Avante, uh, the Bayliner Avante and the, um, the Carver, um, do they have those options? Was that an option that they, they had when they were, when they were building them? Yeah. So what I've seen with Bayliner, the Avanti, it looks like it would be the one that ha would be the most appealing to me just cause the, it seems like they, they've got a nice seat there in the lower helm. Um, okay. and it just looks a little bit more comfortable. The car, the Voyager is hit and miss with that. Um, but that seems to be the, the version that has that, that lower helm option, some with a, with a nice comfy seat, others with maybe just a, just a steering wheel and a place to stand. So it, it okay. kind of seemed to vary a little bit with that, with that bunch. Okay. Yeah. I've got a, a friend that's got the, the, um, the 50 foot Carver motor yacht. And, and I, I know he doesn't have that option in it. Um, so I, I was curious how, how many of those will be out there uh, in the, in the size range that you're looking for, which we haven't even talked about that. Have you kind of zeroed down on a size that you feel is one going to give you that option and, and two kind of fit everything else that that's in your criteria? Yeah. So uh, I'd say definitely, you know, definitely bigger than 23. Um, but, but the ones I'm looking at right now are in the 32 to, to 38 ish range. Okay. Um, and, and, and the reason I say that is primarily because that, that Avante looks like it's in the 32 and then the, the Carver, um, comes in the, in the 38 foot though, you know, you did mention, well, the, the motor yacht and Bayliner has some of those, and those seem to vary a little bit too, within that 30 foot range. Yeah. And there's, depending on the years that you're looking, the, the models change a little bit. Um, I, I, I wish I had, I wish I had some specifics to give you, but I just don't, um, in that, mm -hmm. um, in that kind of subcategory. Um, the, the things that I would, that I can share that I think would be valuable is as you are, as you're looking at a boat in that price range, in that size range, um, there, you're going to have to go through potentially a couple to find a, a good quality one. That would be, I, I think that would be the thing that, that I could probably give you the most insight on is there, there's different systems and there's, there's so many different things involved with the cruiser that the maintenance that the boat has been taken care of how well it's been taken care of. Have they added anything or, or done some work on it themselves that's going to cause you an issue? Um, have you watched my, my used cruiser video? I don't think I watched the used cruiser. I watched the one on Bayliners. Okay. Um, and then I heard a conversation with somebody in um, Louisiana. Okay. Um, okay. Gotcha. But Gotcha. I, I did a, I did a video. It's, it's one of my more popular videos. It's, it's how to inspect a used cruiser from 24 to 50 feet. Um, and, and I go through it's shoot. It's almost an 50 minutes long, I think. Um, but I go through, every, Oh, hang on one second. My dog is got locked in my office here. Nine. Oh, the joys of working from home um, that, um, but that used that used cruiser video, I, I just go through all of the systems and some things to look for, you know, when you're, when you're looking at a boat in that size range, um, the, it's, it's going to have, you know, maybe a microwave, maybe a, a stove top. Um, but there's, it's probably going to have, um, heat and AC at that size range may or may not have a generator. Um, but there, it's just more complicated. It's going to have shore power and electrical systems, um, depending on how the people used it. You know, they may have added a microwave in or, or they may have said, hey, 
we're going to fish this. So we're going to put a rod holder here. And, and some of those, some of those additions that people make, if they don't do them right, um, can cause some problems that are under the surface that you may not really recognize uh, until it's too late. So I would really encourage one for you to watch that video so you know how to inspect it yourself. And then two is um, probably hire a good surveyor locally um, that can go through and, and really dig into the, to the workings of the boat. Um, and, and then maybe even have uh, hire a mechanic to go through and, and check out the engines. Cause you may have twins even as you get up to the, the 30, you know, that 32, 38, you, you, you might have twins um, in all of those. Mm -hmm. That's, that's kind of, that would be my assumption. And they'd, they'd have the twin engine. Now, um, you know, one of the takeaways that I, that I got from your other video was definitely get these inspected some, especially these older boats. Yeah, for um, sure. You know, when it comes to the, the quality between the brands. So I, I think the two that I'm mainly looking at right now are the, the Bayliner and the Carver. And, you know, I know that there's been there, there, everybody has their comments about, um, <laughs> about Bayliners and that. Um, and, you know, I, and I guess I'm wondering if, is it possible to get a decent quality uh, Bayliner in this size range? So should, should I be thinking about it or should I just, you know, think, boy, that's, that's, it, it's too important from a safety perspective and it's too, um, it's too big of an investment to, to get something in that Bayliner line or, and how does that compare with Carver? Let's well, just, uh, is, does that tee you up yeah, enough to be able to talk a little yeah, bit? About yeah, these yeah, things? yeah. I, I can give, I can give some insights. Um, so here's my, here's my opinion on this is at the, at the age range that you're going to be in to hit the price point um, that you want to be, um, those boats are going to be at least 10, 15 years old, if not a little older. And it, at that point, if it was going to break, it's broken. So if, if it's a quality issue, um, and if, if you go through it and you inspect it properly, a surveyor inspects it, you're going to find all those issues because they're going to be a little bit more obvious. Now, are there going to be some, some maybe structural things that can come up? Yeah. Uh, but, but the surveyor and yourself, or if you watch that video are going to be able to find those. Um, it, it's different than it, the, to me, like the brand quality is more important when it's uh, five years old. Um, because man, everything looks great. It's shiny. It's new. This, it, nothing's broken yet, but 15 years into it, it's more about how well has it been taken care of and maintained than it is about that original quality construction. Because if it was poor construction, it's already failed and it's going to show itself easily to you when you, when you board it and do the inspection stuff. D does that make sense? It does. Yeah. I think that's helpful. Um, yeah, it's it's really weird because it's not, you know, people like, oh, man, an old Bayliner, stay away from it. Well, first of all, if, if you read the comments in my Bayliner video, um, everybody that says, you know, Bayliner is a, a POS, I say, you know, what Bayliner have you owned? And they never respond. But then people get on and say, I've got the 1987 Bayliner with the force. And here was my experience with it. Those are the comments that I I. I put any stock into. And I had so many positive Bayliner experiences um, that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's sort of even changed my opinion slightly, although I didn't have that negative opinion of the brand as, as much as other people did. Um, but th that's, that's my take on a used boat is you got the advantage that if it was cheaply built, you're going to be able to look and say, oh, it broke because it was cheaply built. They cut a corner there. And there's some advantages to that on the use side. Okay. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Um, I had some other kind of considerations here. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go fi fire away. Start throwing away. Well, so, <clears throat> you know, the inbo inboard versus IO. Um, so I guess my thought I would almost prefer the inboard outboard because one, I'm more familiar with that. Um, 
and two, that you can kind of raise the trim on those when you get mm-hmm. into maybe some tighter anchorages or something. Um, but is there anything else I need to think about or any drawbacks mechanically or, or performance wise? Yep. Yeah, I, I did. I've done a video on this as well. Um, comparing, uh, uh, direct drives, stern drives, uh, outboards and jet drives. Um, but, uh, but we'll focus on the stern drives versus the, the direct drive or V drive, depending on the boat. Um, you're likely going to leave the boat in the water. If you're looking at a 32 to 38 footer, you're likely going to leave it in the water for the season and haul it, you know, in the winter. Um, Mm -hmm. it is much easier to do that. There's less maintenance when you look at a a V drive. So it's an inboard, uh, where the engines are in the boat and there's just that shaft and a prop running to a rudder. So you put a couple anodes on there. So if there's some, if there's some straight current that, that you don't get that corrosion from the electrolysis, uh, and there's, there's nothing else other than a shaft and a prop. Uh, in the in the uh, rudder, so they're easier to maintain in the water at a marina. With a stern drive, those stern drives have submerged the whole time, and you're going to have the extra repair of of keeping up with the anodes. And if there is some stray current, um, you know there's some other things you can do to mercathodes and some other things you can do to protect them. But there's going to be corrosion that gets started uh, on those drives. Um, you have the potential for the bellows to fail and the boat to sink. Um, for, for those listening, the bellows are little rubber boots that allow the shift cables to go from in, in the engine compartment um, through the hull to the, to the drive. So it's basically a protects water from, from sinking your boat. Um, those need to be repaired or replaced uh, periodically every couple of years. Um, and if you have a failure, your boat's taken on water and it, it can be a, a, a catastrophic failure for, you know, with the hundred dollar part. Um, so I prefer the V drives or the, the inboards um, when you're looking at leaving a cruiser in the water. Um, now let's go to performance. The, the advantage of the stern drives is what you said. I can trim my boat up. Um, I can get a little bit better performance. If I'm at a shallow anchorage, I can trim them up. And I don't have to worry about, um, you know, dragging the bottom or, or causing damage to my prop. Um, they're going to be a little bit faster typically. So they're going to give a little bit better efficiency, a little bit more top end speed. Um, the inboards are going to have kind of a, a bigger prop on them, um, which means they're a little bit easier to handle in tight quarters. Um, but there's there's at a single angle and the only adjustment you can make to the um to the hole is with your trim tabs so the trim tabs can Mm -hmm. go up and down and they can keep your bow you know up into the waves but you can't adjust them like you can the the stern drive trim does does that make sense to explain that well enough yeah i that actually gave me some other things to think about (laughs) um good (laughs) no i i appreciate that because i um you know, I had, I wasn't thinking about it from that maintenance perspective. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that's helpful. And it, and it actually, I had a preconceived notion that you probably won't go quite as fast with those, with those direct drives. And it sounds like that, that's kind of right. Yeah. Yeah. You're hundred percent accurate on that. Yep. Um, you will, your maneuverability is better. Your speed is, is worse. Um, as far as gallons per hour, your, your burn of the engine, I, I, I'm going to say the stern drives typically are better. Um, uh, but, but I don't think it's by much. Um, now mm-hmm. you will find that when you hit a certain point around 34 feet, um, is typically the cut where they'll, you're no longer going to have stern drives as an option. Um, most of those boats are going to be, are going to be in boards, um, and, mm-hmm. and up to 38, you're maybe even 40, you're still going to be gas. So everything that you're going to be looking at is likely going to be gas as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so diesel versus regular gas. Um, it's, yeah. So my preconceived notion is that um, you probably have to fill up the diesel less often, 
but it, but you may pay more um, winterizing and maintenance. Um, but I don't. That, maybe I'm yeah, it's here's it's the diesels. The engines themselves are going to cost significantly more. So you typically don't find a diesel engine until you start hitting 40 plus feet um, mm -hmm. because it's just, it's not economical to put them in um, a, a smaller boat. On the other hand, they're going to run 20,000 hours, whereas, uh, you know, a Mercruiser or a Volvo um, is going to run, you know, 1,000, 1,500, maybe 2,000 if you really, really, really take care of it. Um, so, but, but they're significantly cheaper, um, when it's new. So you'll find those in the smaller boats, as far as maintenance costs, um, the winterization is going to be similar. I think, um, okay. I don't think there's a major difference in, in cost of maintaining it. Um, it's, do you have access to fuel, which on Lake Superior, you will, you'll have diesel fuel available to you. Um, so that's not an issue where you are. Um, but I think it's going to be more a, a function of, I, I don't think you're going to have the option of many diesel boats in the size range that you're looking. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that makes sense. So, um, I, I guess that gets me back to, um, just stepping back again, um, and thinking about the overall layout and things like that of these, of the, either the dual helm versus the the canvas and and you know i would feel more comfortable putting downriggers on something with that dual helm like the voyager or the avanti versus um like a i'll just throw like a larson out there or something like that those seem sure. to have like a be built for comfort in that in the stern there a little bit with the table and then and kind of the nice seating arrangement and i just i'm not sure how how those would be set up and how to think about that but maybe that's just a personal thing i need to think through yeah i, I i'm not sure um the the one boat when you said kind of what you were looking to do there's a boat that came to mind um it, it doesn't have the dual helm but the sea ray amberjack um is okay. is another one that's that is a a cruiser that was initially designed to do some fishing um, they were more common at the coast. I don't know how many you'll have up in your area, um, but that may be a layout that, um, that you want to check, just check a few out online. Um, and, and there'll be, um, I think they made that up to, oh, probably 2006 or 2007. Um, but it's, it, but it doesn't have the dual helm set up, but that, okay. it, it, it does have that fishing capability along with the overnighting capability for sure. Okay. Sounds good. Um, boy, you're really answering a lot of my questions. I'm kind of, kind of scraping here, but I, you know, the, the last thing I have written down and I don't know if you have any opinion on, um, you know, it, it's, if I'm going to need to be doing some anchoring, I'm looking at anchor sizes um, and making sure that I can, you know, what I buy is able to, to handle this, I think, or I'm going to need, can I assume that the windlass is going to be able to handle an oversized anchor if need be? I would guess so. Um, I, I, again, it's going to depend on the, on the exact boat and, you know, have they monkeyed with the, with the windlass or is it, is it the factory okay. uh, windlass? But um, I would say um, depending on if it's the factory, I, I think you're probably going to be okay um, with uh, with going with the heavier anchor. I would I, I would do some research, but I wouldn't buy anything until you know exactly what boat you have. Um, mm -hmm. What I would recommend is um, is using chain uh, in, in your situation. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not rigged with chain, um, you know, make sure that the windlass is going to be, is going to be okay to run the, the size that you have through it. Um, but I think that's going to give you a better, a better bite and more security, uh, when you're out there, just in case something does come up and make sure it's all, um, you know, put together properly with, with, um, uh, wire and, and, uh, the shackles and all that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. That's one thing I want to make sure I have just in case we end up in a spot where we have to have to go into a little cove or something and we're in the wind and yep. storm and stuff. 
Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, with, with doing that, you're, you're planning to overnighting, having that, having a secondary anchor as well is probably a wise idea um, that you can, you can tie off just in case something happens. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, I guess I'm open to any other things you think uh, that, that should be considered here, or if, uh, you know, you know, with an inspection and, and all of this, I think I'm, I'm feeling like I'm in a pretty comfortable to move forward. Well, good, good. I, I, I was nervous about this conversation because I, I know you had some specific questions that I, I just didn't feel like I could say, hey, this is the right brand for you or this is what to consider with the dual helm. Um, but I'm glad that, glad that you got value out of this. Um, and, and really, it's a matter of, I think, is going out, getting on some of these boats and, and experiencing them. And I think that's going to lead you in the right direction. And then, you know, make sure that you're that you do the proper inspections and um the great thing is that you're a boater already and you'll you'll notice things that a first time buyer wouldn't uh because of your experience so i i appreciate you you joining us and thanks for sticking through some of the technical difficulties here and uh yeah. let me know let me know what you end up settling in on and i would love to see a picture of it okay yeah sounds good and again thank you for uh for doing this and, and giving me the time to just kind of ask some questions and and get my thoughts going as we approach spring and, and, and buying season for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it's just a matter of the, of the warm weather. I, I love talking boats and, and happy to do it. Thanks, Darcy. All right. Thank you. Bye. Let's pull up the anchor and run this podcast back to the dock. We'll be back again with another helpful and fun episode next time. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, visit boat buyers, secretweapon.com slash guest and I'll help offer insights into your boat research and shopping experience. Also, we'd appreciate it if you took just two minutes to rate and review this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. It helps others find us so we can help more boaters. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it in your boating groups on social media. They will certainly thank you. And by the way, if you haven't already, grab your free Boat Buyers Secret Weapon Toolkit at BoatBuyersSecretWeapon.com slash toolkit. And so you don't pay too much for your next boat, visit BoatBuyersSecretWeapon.com slash save for a short video. Now, before we go, I want to leave you with a few first-time boating tips for when you own your new boat. Number one, know your local boating laws, basic navigation rules, and how to operate your boat safely. It'll make boating even more fun for everyone. Two, be aware of your wake at all times and pay attention to no wake zones because you are responsible for your wake. When maneuvering at slow speeds, you can put out an enormous wake. If going slow, be courteous, save some fuel, and drop down to idle speed, just in forward gear to ensure there is no wake. This could save you an expensive ticket and will keep you from being that guy on your waterway. Number three, boats do not have headlights. They have docking lights, specifically made for seeing in tight quarters and docking. Do not turn your docking lights on while cruising down the water. It can blind other boaters and is very dangerous and, again, could save you an expensive ticket. Number four, follow the maintenance schedule for your boat. Change the oil, impeller, gear lube. Winterize if you need to winterize in your area. Inspect your trailer tires, bearings, and grease the hubs if you're a trailer boater to ensure you don't experience expensive and unnecessary repairs that will impact your boating time. Number five, always double check your plug is in, your battery is charged, and the fuel is full before heading out for a day on the water. It could just save your boating day. And if you're a trailer boater, I've got a few extra tips. Number one, at the boat ramp, prepare your boat, your gear, and your guests in the staging area. Then when you're ready, back down the ramp, unload the boat, head to the parking lot, and right back down to your boat to be fast and courteous to your fellow boaters and don't tie up that ramp unnecessarily. Next, use transom tie-down straps when trailing your boat. Very bad things can happen if you don't, and they do happen. Three, check everything in the boat is secure before heading down the road. Seat cushions, gear, keys, towels, even tubes and lily pads can get blown out 
when pulling your boat down the highway or interstate. And most important, have fun. Enjoy your boat and get out of the water as much as possible because life truly is better on a boat. Until next time, this is your friend in boating, Captain Matt.